This is talking about the church today. You know. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way, testing for sin, <laughs> testing to see if your nature lines up with Christ. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders, and are brass and iron. They are all corrupters, they're not gold or silver, they're brass and iron. The bellows are burned, those are the trials and tribulations. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth, but the founder melteth in vain. So the sin is consumed in the fire, but the wicked are not plucked away. The lead is, is melted, that means it's possible to cast these bad qualities, these character flaws out of yourself. But the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So we know that the Lord does reject some people. But the most horrible part is that you don't know it if the Lord rejects you. The ones that the Lord's rejecting, they don't know they're rejected. Until at some point they wind up in a pig pen somewhere. Twenty years of, de of deceiving themselves. They may get a revelation that the Lord, the Lord left them. And they may sit down and try to remember where was the last time I heard from God. That's the hardest part for me to see. I know God is righteous. And I would like him to get them put their back up against the wall, tell them, look, I'm leaving you. <laughs> but I think if he did that, they wouldn't even believe it. The Lord actually had me say that to my pastor, the one that raised me up. He actually had me send him a letter, and I drew a little picture, and it said Ichabod over the church, meaning God has left you. And God left that church, but he hated me and called me a false prophet and blasphemed and maligned my name until the day that he died and blamed me for destroying his church. So the Lord sent a prophet to him to say, Ichabod is left, you know, repent. But instead he blamed me. So that's why. So God probably does do that. He sends a prophet to tell you the Lord is leaving you and you kill his prophets. See? Who are you, some little widow in my church, to say that to me? I'm the one that you acknowledge from the pulpit, speak the word of the Lord. You printed my prophecy on a piece of paper along with your prophecy. You called me a prophet in your church. But when I say Ichabod to you, I'm a false prophet. So you see, brethren, that the prophet of God, or the word, the Lord sending the word to, of warning to somebody, it only works for the true servants of God. <laughs> that that it will only help the people that have the heart of God. That they'll hear the word of the prophet and repent and cry out to God and repent. So what did that prove about that man? That I, I loved him. He was my pastor. I loved him. What did that prove? Yet he did not have the heart of God. What does that mean? It means that when the word of God comes to these people, if, it, if it's inconvenient for them, if they don't want to hear it, they, they condemn the messenger. That means you're reprobate. That's what this scripture means. It means you're reprobate. It means that God has given you every opportunity to have your nature purified, but the wicked were not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. The Lord rejected him and his wife. So, when a prophet comes to you with a word of knowledge, you better be careful that you don't reject it because you don't like it. And brethren, I was guilty of that. Okay? I was in another state having trouble with my daughter. And a young lady in that church gave me a prophecy about my daughter. And I was really offended and didn't believe it. 
And it wasn't until a year or two later. So I, I lost a whole year or two. And the Lord said, well, I told you. You did? Yeah, you told me through that prophet. That you, I told that young lady to her face that I, I thought it was a false prophecy. Yeah. And it was God. Be careful. Be careful. Make your life easier. Make your life easier, say, Lord. I never said, Lord, was that you? I never asked him if that could have been him speaking through that young woman. I just said, that can't be true. But it was true. Okay. So we're now going to take a look at 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth, are there any questions uh, about what I've taught so far? Everybody's got it, right? I'll tell you what the Lord told me about my daughter that I couldn't believe. My daughter was troubled the day she was born. <laughs> my little baby was troubled from two weeks on. She wouldn't sleep, and then she turned into a big rebel. And uh, I was struggling with her in those days. And what that young lady had to say to me was that I was in pride. And because I knew, and it was true, everything I'm telling you about my daughter was true. She was difficult. There were problems. She was wrong in almost everything that she did in relationship to me. Yeah. And the Lord was telling me, Sheila, if you want, that you're responding to the difficulty with pride. He wasn't, I took it to say that I was to blame for the problem. I was doing the best as I could as a mother. It was a big difficulty. And the Lord was saying to me, Sheila, you're dealing with it in pride. I want to show you how to deal with it. You want to save her? You have to stop dealing with the problem in pride. See? But my pride was so high that I couldn't believe the Lord was telling me that I was dealing with the problem in pride. So two years later, a couple of years later, I had matured, I had matured that much more. And I understood that the Lord, the Lord had another way for me to deal with the problem. And he wanted me to die for her. He wanted me to stop saying, who do you think you are talking to your mother like that? Or you shouldn't talk to your mother like that, or you shouldn't do that. He said, do you want to save her? And then you have to die for her. And he showed me how he wanted me to deal with it. So that was what I couldn't deal with. It took me two years to find out that he was telling me I was dealing with the problem in pride. So thank God I just lost two years. But I learned an important lesson. Anyone that says anything to you Someone on the subway, someone on the train, someone on the shopping line at, at, at the supermarket. They turn around and say something to you. If you really want the best that God has for you, you really need to ask the Lord, did you say that through that person? And I can't, I don't understand it. How could you tell me I'm in pride when she's so disrespectful to me, etc., etc.? If I had done that, I would have saved two years. And you can save a lot of time in your life. Anybody, the Lord can speak to you, through, and he'll overshadow anybody and talk to him. If he wants to, especially God's people, but it doesn't have to be God's people. Besides, you don't know who's next to you on the line in the supermarket. You don't know who they are. You know? And you all heard the testimony about my daughter, you know, in the, this was a long time ago, in the sports bar with her friend. And this guy at the bar is staring at her. She's there with her friends, you know, that's what they did in that day. I guess they still do it. I don't know, they hang out in sports bars. They go out with the girls. And she thought he was looking at her, looking at her, looking at her. He was an older man. She wasn't interested. He walked over to the table. And she thought he was going to try and pick her up. And he said to her, you know, your mother's worried about you. You should be in church. You shouldn't be here in a bar. You should be in church. Your mother's worried about you. And she calls me up on the phone and says, Ma, I know you're going to laugh at this, but you have to hear what happened to me. Yeah. At a bar. Who knows who he was? You know, backslidden Christian. I don't know. God could use anybody. Brethren, if you want the best out of your life, if you want the best, listen for God's voice everywhere. And all that you have to do is ask, Lord, was that you? That's all. Lord, was that you? Ouch. You told me I was in pride. Ouch. 
Yeah. God, God loves you. He wants the very best life for you that you can person, uh, possibly have. But brethren, we have to be corrected because everybody has pride. Everybody has wrong thinking. Everybody has rebellion. Everybody. And he cannot give you what he wants to give you while you're moving in those spirits. You have to mature, you see. You have to become a better person in his image. But he wants the best for you, always. Always. So this is First John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoso believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And I told you that on Thursday. I had a problem with that for years. Everyone that believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Well, everybody that has a Christian background tells you that, and they're not born of God. What can this possibly mean? Well, we find the answer is a few verses down. What does it mean to believe that Jesus is, is born of God? Okay. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, whoever, what, is, how, what is the proof that you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Is it your words? Are you calling me a liar? No, but maybe you think it's the truth. But if it's not the truth, it's a lie. If it comes out of your carnal mind, it's a lie. If you think that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, but you don't, it's your carnal mind lying to you. So there's a proof, there's a way of proving that you really believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that's what we have to look for. We have to look for that proof. The King James calls it a record. So we'll get to it. It's a few verses down. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begat him, loveth him, I'm sorry, and everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So if you love, if you love the Father, you're going to love the one who's born of God. If you don't love the one that's born of God, you don't love the Father. It means you don't know the Father. It means you don't have the Son. Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you truly loved God, you would love me too. Why don't you love me? Because, because you're not born of God. See? This is a witness now. John 8, verses 39 to 43. Oh, this is the exact scripture. <laughs> they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. They said, then said they unto him, We are not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You cannot understand, you cannot understand what someone who's in the mind of God is saying to you. If you don't have the mind of God, you'll see it as an evil thing. The carnal mind will see it as an evil thing. It will accuse you of having an evil motive towards them. So you have to know that. If somebody's reprobate, you need to know that when you deliver a word to them, they're going to see it as an evil intention in you. So sometimes the Lord wants you to say things to people, and sometimes you should shut your mouth, because the person will just use it against you to hurt you. What comes to mind is a video that I saw about Benny Hinn, and I had my doubts about Benny Hinn. I actually, I think he has a spirit guide, but aside from that, what, the, what one news media did to him was, un, was horrendous. Uh, I don't know if they, if they understood enough. I, I don't know if they, the degree to which they understood what they were doing was horrible. They sent a, a, they sent a plant into his meeting, into Benny Hinn's meeting to get up on the, to, to raise her hand and say that she was crippled and now she could walk. So you can see the camera, Benny, he's all excited, and the people on, of his staff, they're all excited that a cripple was healed in his meeting. And then after that, they come out with the cameras and say she was never paralyzed. 
we sent her here to lie to him. And I saw Benny Hinn's face. It was like, I really felt bad for him. It was like a sick look on his face because either they were absolutely evil or they just didn't understand anything about anything. Benny Hinn didn't pray over her, you know, and say, I prophesy that you're going to be healed. Now stand up. The Lord just told me that he healed you. He didn't do that. The woman sat in the meeting and came up on a stage. They, they filmed the whole thing. So how was that his fault if she said that she was under the anointing and she was healed? How was that his fault? So it was really hard. He looked absolutely sick. So I think the man's been severely persecuted. These are people that are reprobate. You need to know who you're dealing with, you see. If the day ever comes, I'm not, I wouldn't even want it, but if the day ever comes that the press, that we get the attention of the press, you know, they really to be avoided as much as possible. They're evil. You look at what they do to President Trump. They're evil. You know, reprobate minds. You know, that hate God. And do, don't they hate God? They don't understand him? You have to know who you're dealing with. And you don't tell your deep, dark secrets to these people. You don't tell them about your ministry. You don't tell them about this ministry. You don't give out any information to people that, that are not sent by God. See, they have evil motives towards you. You don't want to be paranoid, but I'm telling you the truth. Verse 2. Uh, by this we know that we love the children of God. This is how we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. So, what are his commandments? Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now that doesn't mean you have to be best friends with everybody, but you treat them as you would like to be treated. That's what it means. You can't say that you love God when you hate your brother. Because it's a lie. You may believe it, but it's the lie of your carnal mind. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Well, they're not grievous if you're moving in Christ. If you're a carnal person and you're laced with envy and pride and, and, and arrogance and, and rage, it's very hard to control yourself to not do evil things towards people that you have ungodly motives towards. It has to be an overall desire on your part to live righteously, and everybody that comes into your life comes into that aura, so to speak, of your desire to do righteously. Some people, it's easier to deal with righteously than it is other people, but you have to be in that state of mind to start with. And then if you find someone that's treating you badly, it becomes a struggle. But you, you, stand, you stand a very good chance of overcoming if you're already in that state of wanting to treat everybody properly and forgive them for their bad behavior towards you. Because, as, as Jesus said, they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know who they're cursing. So we should do everything possible to be at peace with people. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Mark 3.35, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So he says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is thy, my, thy mother. <coughs> I got you the wrong scripture. There is a scripture that tells you who his neighbor is, who, you, who your neighbor is. I don't recall exactly what it says. I should quote that scripture. So it says, you love your neighbor as yourself. That has something, as I said, I, I pulled the wrong scripture here. It's basically people, I guess I shouldn't say anything. I'll come back to it. Maybe I'll take a break and look at that scripture. It doesn't mean the person that's trying to kill you. You don't have to love the person that's trying to, that has a gun in your head as yourself. But you should deal decently with everybody. 
Verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Galatians 3.22. But the scripture, the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus, by faith of Jesus Christ, might be given to them that believe. So our faith is the faith of Jesus Christ. We don't have any faith of our own. We just have hope, okay? But we receive the faith of Jesus Christ if we believe. And by that faith, we overcome it. the world. What is the world? Each one of us is a world. I told you that earlier. The, the soul that we are is a, a universe in and of itself. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that where we started? Whoever believes that Jesus is, is, the, is the whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, that was verse one, and now we're up to verse five. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the same thing. Jesus the Christ is born of God. Okay, who is he? Now we're going to get a description of who this person is that we're believing in. Verse six. He is the one that came in this world, into this world, by water, that soul. He was born as the second Adam. And blood. He came into this world by spirit, that's the Shekinah. He came into this world through the Shekinah that manifested through Elijah. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, not by soul only, but by water and blood, by soul and spirit. He was born by soul and spirit. And we found out recently that there's a second born-again experience that's coming. And that second born-again experience is when the Lord Jesus Christ joins to the mind of Christ in us. We're born again as the second Adam. The first born-again experience was the, the, the regeneration of the, of the young man, of the, of, the, of the child, the lower part of Adam in the earth. But the regeneration of the whole Adam exists in heaven and earth. So this is the one that overcomes the world, okay? And what is the world? Rather, the world is our own soul. This man is being born in us that's going to overcome, overthrow our soul. Our soul is the old man. It's the first Adam. He is the source of all our problems. So we need this Christ Jesus born in us. The one that's born in our soul, that's after the seed of Christ marries our soul and becomes the mind of God, okay? And he also comes by blood, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, joining to him. When that happens to us, the first Adam, our old man, gets torched. I just told you that a few minutes ago. That's the overthrow of us all. That is our goal. The overthrow of our fallen soul, the cause of our death, the cause of all the problems in our life, our fallen soul, will be torched, okay, when the second Adam Comes in, who has a relationship with Elohim, the Shekinah. Okay, who has a relationship with the Shekinah, who brings God into our soul, our universe, our soul universe. Okay. Torches our fallen nature. He's the one. That's who we're talking about when we talk about Jesus Christ, who was born of God. Okay. His counterpart is going to be born in us. We're not talking about someone that's hanging on a cross with his heart pumping, you know, like they show some of the statues, or his heart bleeding, <laughs> or sitting on his mother's lap, okay? We're talking about a spiritual man born in us as our new mind and our new nature, an inner man. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's not the crucifix on your neck. Okay? He's not hanging on a cross. He was taken down off of the cross. He's not laying in a cave buried anywhere. He rose from the dead. And he's working ceaselessly to give all of humanity, starting with his church, the same experience. So when we say that Jesus Christ, is, the who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, we're not talking about the man on the crucifix. 
Oh, I thought you meant the man on the crucifix. No. Listen, brethren, I just want to read you the exact words. But he, let me start over here. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, born in you, born of God in you, you have to believe that it can happen in you. That Jesus Christ was born of God and it can happen to you. You can be born of God. Verse 5. But he, he, but who, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Not the Jesus hanging on the cross. The Son of God that's going to marry the mind of Christ in you. You see? Verse 1. Verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and it can happen to you. Okay, you have the seed of Christ, okay? That's going to marry your soul and become the man child. Verse 5. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, that's going to marry the mind of Christ in you, and the Son of God will be born in you. This is all John is talking about you. He's talking about the individual not someone out there, or up there, or out there, or over there, in you. This is he who came into this world by water, that's by soul, the second Adam, and by blood, the Shekinah, through Elijah, and that soul, I say the second Adam, but maybe I should say the Christ seed, I'm just going to pray about that, came into this water by soul. You know, Adam is a living soul. Adam is soul. So Christ is the seed of that living soul. So I think this should be Christ. He came in, that he came into this world, into your world, into your spiritual universe, by water, the soul of the Christ seed. Okay. Adam was formed from the dust. He was a soul formed from the dust. And Jehovah breathed the breath of life into him. He breathed spirit into him. And he became a living soul. So, this is he that came into this world by water, it's the Christ seed, came into the, into the world by soul, and then the, the blood, the spirit, the Shekinah was breathed into him through Elijah, okay, even Jesus Christ. He came not by water only, not by a seed only, but by the spirit of life which came through Elijah. And it is the spirit of life that he received that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. It is the spirit on the man. Jesus, it is the spirit on you that bears witness whether or not you have had this experience. Whoever, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whosoever believeth that he was born in you is born of God. And this is how you know that he was born in you. Everyone that loveth Christ, everyone that loveth him that begat, that begat Jesus Christ, loveth him also that is begotten of him. This is how you know that Jesus Christ is born in you, or his seed is born in you. You love the other brethren that have his seed born in them. This is about you. This is about the individual. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God. He's, if, you really, if you really truly believe it, he's born in you. Because someone who doesn't have the seed of God cannot believe it. And the proof that you, that you have this seed that helps you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God is that you recognize and love the other brethren that have his seed in you. And that's a challenge because we're brought together from all different walks of life. People that we would never be friends with in this natural world. But what holds us together is the life of Christ in us. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Christ born of God, one who believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And this is how you know it. 
that you believe it is that you recognize and love the other believers. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world of your soul? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So the first one is for the Christ. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, that you, if you believe that this that the Christ seed is available to you. Verse 5. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the that's the Adam from above. That's the male seed from above. The significance here, it's really hard to understand that the only way you can believe it is if it's happening to you. That's what the Apostle is saying. You can only believe it if it's happening to you. So verse 1 says, you believe Jesus Christ is, the, Jesus Christ is born of God when you are born of God, when you receive the Christ seed. Okay, that becomes the mind of Christ. Okay, and then when, when the Lord Jesus Christ joins with the mind of Christ in you, the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. Then you'll believe that Jesus is the Son of God when you experience the Son of God joining himself to you. You'll believe it when you experience it. You will believe it in a way that God says is truth. You won't believe it in a fantasy, okay, of a man on a cross or, or whatever. If, you, if you're beyond thinking that Jesus is a statue somewhere, if you're beyond that, brethren, the carnal mind has all kinds of perverted ideas of who Jesus is and what he is. So the apostle has said you can only believe the truth when it happens to you. And I know it's really hard to understand that from this scripture, but that's what he's saying. You can only believe it when it happens to you, and it's in two stages. You receive the Christ seed that marries your, your, uh, your soul, and then becomes the mind of, mind of Christ. Okay, then you have Christ, then you believe that Jesus Christ is born of God. And then when the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, marries the mind of Christ in you, you'll believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But what does that mean? It still doesn't make any sense. Listen, let me try to explain it to you this way. What the Apostle is saying is that there's certain knowledge and understanding that comes to you. When you believe that Jesus is born of God, it's not just a sentence, I believe Jesus Christ is born of God. There is a whole body of knowledge including the teaching in the church that the grace and eternal life and the whole teaching of the of the uh, of the epistles in the new testament if you really believe that jesus is christ is, is one of god you will believe all of that's in the new testament everything that's taught about jesus christ being the son of god if you really believe that he's the son of god you'll believe everything that's taught about him being the son of god you can't just believe a sentence. You have to go into the scripture and find out what does it mean Jesus Christ is born of God? Well, the church would tell you he's born of a virgin. See? The whole doctrine that has to do with Jesus Christ being born of God. When you believe it, then you believe that Jesus Christ is born of God. If you want to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you have to believe the whole doctrine that's associated with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You can't even understand this New Testament scripture mm. <laughs> without understanding this. There are two different doctrines. Jesus Christ is born of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Two bodies of doctrine. Two different grades at school. Now, what the Apostle is going to be telling us as we get further on down, when you truly have these experiences, but the way he expresses it is, when you truly believe it, you will have a specific experience that will be the proof that you believed it. That's what we're getting to. I'm going very slow. Yeah. That's, what the Paul is, that's what the Apostle is saying. This is Apostle John. There is a proof. There is a proof that you have believed this. Something has to happen to you. There is proof that you have believed. It's not a thought in your carnal mind. So this, this is what you're looking for. This is Jesus Christ who was our example. He came into this world by soul, by the Christ seed, okay, and by blood, the spirit of the Shekinah through Elijah even Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit, which is the blood, 
that there is witness because the spirit is truth. So the soul doesn't have truth. The experience that you have when you receive the Christ seed, that's not truth. It's not called truth, even though there's some truth in it. You learn about the Holy Spirit. It's not called truth. Truth refers to the reality of the spiritual man that's coming into existence. So there's different grades of truth. The truth that you receive with the Holy Spirit is the truth about the grace of God. You're told Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but you don't know what that means. And then you're told he's born of a virgin, which is the false teaching, but it, it, it gets you in there somehow. You learn about Joseph, the genealogies are there in the scripture. You get some degree of truth, but it's not called truth. I don't know what it's called, introduction. It's not called truth. Truth is the reality of the Son of God, which is esoteric doctrine. And as I told you at the beginning of this message, the whole Bible is who he is. Not only the whole Bible, but the esoteric understanding of the whole Bible is who he is. We don't even know who he is. I don't even know who he is. I have an acquaintance with him. I have just the beginning of understanding of a clue as to who he is. So let me say it again. There has to be a proof. If you say that you believe that Jesus Christ is born of God, if you say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that you believe that, there is a proof about your life that will prove it. So let's find out what it is. The spirit beareth witness, not the soul. The spirit beareth witness because the spirit is truth. The spirit of truth is the Shekinah, brethren. Understanding. The Shekinah's quality is understanding. The spiritual truth of who Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is. How do you believe? Listen, if I go to you and I say, I'm the son of, uh, of, uh, of Donald, I'm the, I'm the daughter of Donald Trump, you know, I mean, I can say that, right? But you need proof. They want to see your driver's license, right? Except unless you want to vote. You know, if you want to vote, you can say anything that you want. Okay. You need proof. Okay, I believe you. Well, what does that mean? Proof, there's proof. What kind of proof are we looking for? The spirit. The spirit is truth. Now there are three that bear record in heaven. Here's the truth. Here's the, here's the witness. There are three that bear record in heaven. Now, I looked at this, I knew this couldn't be right, so I looked at it in the interlinear text. And it's my educated opinion that uh, the King James translators reversed the word the spirit in verse 8. It just says the spirit. And in verse 7 it says the Holy Ghost. And I suggest to you that the Holy Ghost should be in verse 8 and the Spirit should be in verse 7. For there were three that bear record in heaven. The Father, okay, the Word, which is primordial Adam, okay, and the, un, the word Spirit is unmodified. I suggest to you the word is the eternal Spirit. In a couple of verses down we read about the eternal Spirit. The eternal Spirit. That's the Shekinah. So there are three that bear record in heaven. That person that says that they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they have to have in their heaven, which is their mind, the, the righteousness of the Father, okay, and esoteric doctrine is in the Father. Okay? Uh, the righteousness of the Father, esoteric doctrine in the Word, and this eternal spirit. That's the spirit of life. I don't have that yet. My body's still aging. If the Lord doesn't move, I'm going to die, as we all are. So to say that you're the Son of God, you have to have eternal life. The Father, the Word, and the eternal Spirit. Jesus Christ has that, right? How do I know that he has that? Because he gave it to me. He's given it to me. I have the Spirit, I have the Word, and the Father's in the Word. I don't have the third one yet. I don't have the eternal Spirit yet. See? Listen, brethren. The proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is that he gave me the potential to, to have eternal life. Somebody, and 
there has to be a lot of somebodies have to inherit eternal life to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. It's the same principle as Paul saying to the Galatians, you are the proof of my apostleship. I say that to you all. When I see spiritual growth in you, you are the proof of my apostleship. You are the proof that God sent me to you. You're prospering, you're growing, you're maturing. Okay, you're the proof. Where's the proof that Jesus rose from the dead? Where's the proof that he has eternal life? It's not here. So the whole world, the whole Christian world is dancing around the mountain, the, the bottom of the mountain, making golden calves, because there's no proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. The church of Jesus Christ has to rise, because if it doesn't rise, there's no proof that Jesus rose. And that makes God a liar. So I listened, I listened to someone on the internet yesterday, a Christian, you know, and uh, says the whole world might blow up. Then The whole world's not blowing up, brethren, because God cannot be a liar. God, it's, it's impossible for God to lie. So a proof that Jesus Christ rose from the, from the dead, that the Father raised Jesus from the dead, must appear in this earth for the whole world to see. Well, God is a liar. And we are the proof. Okay. And so far, nothing's, nothing's happening that can be seen or recognized by the world. Brethren, this is an issue of God's righteousness. This is an issue of God's reputation. You people out there, you don't have a clue as to what you're all dealing with. There is nothing that the powers and principalities of this world can do that can stop the proof of Jesus' resurrection from appearing in this world. Nobody gets it. Even the church doesn't get it. Not after you die, right here in this world, eternal life by the spirit of righteousness. See? There's going to be a whole bunch of us that they can't kill. It has to happen. God cannot be a lawyer. So you believe Jesus Christ was born of God? Where's your proof? Well, the church has some proof. The spirit, the spirit in the church, the miracles that happened in Pentecost. There's proof that Jesus was born of God. Yeah. But the world doesn't believe it, but the proof is there. Now we want to believe that he's the son of God. Yeah. Where's the proof? God raised the son from the dead, you see. Where is he? In potential. So there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the eternal spirit of the Shekinah. And they're in potential, because they're, that those, the Father, the Word, and the eternal spirit are in Jesus Christ, and he's in potential. Where is he today? Well, the Word is here. I'm not sure what to say about the Father, but the Word is here. But the eternal spirit of life is not here. That's in the Lord Jesus Christ, has not joined to the mind of Christ yet. Still in heaven, in potential. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Holy Ghost, well, we've seen the Holy Ghost. And the water, so that's not the second item, that's Christ. The soul of the second Adam. It's this, I could say Christ, the soul of the second Adam. The soul of the second Adam. And the blood, the spirit, instead of spirit, I'm going to say, the blood, the spirit of the second Adam. I think that makes it clearer. So the soul, so the, the, the water is the soul of the second Adam. And the spirit is the 
the equivalent of Job of bringing the breath into Adam, and he became a living soul. So we need to be soul and spirit. This is not our body. We're talking about an inner spiritual man, the creation of God. We are the garment that he wears. And when we understand to the point that we become one of mind with him, we will become fully incorporated, and fully incorporated into his existence and share, become co-heirs with him. This is another a person, a spiritual man, being born inside of us, coming into existence inside of us. In, we're the shell. He's coming into existence inside of us. So if we receive the witness of men, and that word in the Greek means Adam, if we, receive, if we receive the witness of Adam, who is the living soul, the witness of God, which is the spirit of truth, for then God is the Shekinah. Okay? God, God is Elohim. Elohim is the Shekinah, the mother joined to the son. Elohim is the mother joined to the son. She is the spirit of life. She is the spirit of truth. And joined to her son, who was raised from the dead, they are called Elohim. So, verse 8 says, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Holy Ghost, which we've seen the Holy Ghost, although it's hard to find him now, we've seen him, and the water, that's Christ, the soul of the second Adam. Okay, That's sort of hard to find. It's hard to identify the soul of the second Adam. But the, what we're looking for is, is compassion. The soul of the second Adam is compassion. The soul is emotions. So the, the, the emotions of God are compassion. And the blood, which is the spirit of the second Adam, which is eternal life. And these three agree in one. So when, when the soul of, of the second Adam appeared, or appears in Pentecost, in the earth, we're looking for the Holy Ghost. We're looking for Christ, the compassion of the second Adam and the blood, the spirit of the second Adam, which is what's doing the miracles. Now, we saw that. That has already appeared in the earth, but it didn't last. Why didn't it last? Because it was just a taste of the world to come. It was an introduction. It was preparing the world that they shouldn't be shocked when it happens out of righteousness. Why is that? Because when those miracles occur out of righteousness, judgment will accompany it. And there's going to be gnashing, wailing and wailing and gnashing of teeth when the judgment falls. Mm -hmm. So the Lord sent it forth as a, as a gift, okay, mm -hmm. without repentance. So you should know that this comes from God, that he does great miracles, mm -hmm. healing and deliverance for his people. See? But the second time, and that the, the, the scripture clearly says that, that Jesus is about to appear the second time, mm -hmm. this time without sin. Mm -hmm. The church completely ignores that scripture. That Jesus, the, Jesus of Nazareth was born a sinner, like the rest of us. And he overcame his, the fallen Adam in him. He over, his soul was overthrown. The second Adam was born in him and overthrew his, his, his soul, his fallen soul, the first Adam. And he became the Son of God and was, was raised from the dead. See? And he's coming again, this time, without sin. What do they do with that scripture? They just ignore it. He's coming this time without sin. And how is he coming? He's coming in two phases. He's coming as the, as the soul of the second Adam, which is Christ that's grafted to you. And he's coming as the spirit, that's the breath of life, that's in, that's in, that's in mankind, the second Adam. Okay. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ, joining to the mind of God in you. He's coming in two phases, this time without sin. The first time he came with sin. Not only, was, not only did Jesus of Nazareth have sin and overcome his fallen soul, I think the Lord's telling me I didn't say that right. That, that's true. But the first time that he came, he came without, without dealing with the sins of the people. That's what the Lord wants me to say. The first time he came, he came as the Holy Spirit. Okay. He came as the Holy Spirit. The Christ, which is the female side of the second Adam, and the blood, which is the spirit, which did the miracles of what we call Pentecost. And he came without sin. 
So the Lord has just corrected me on that scripture because for years I thought that it meant that Jesus was coming the second time without sin. But the Lord has just brought a correction. That scripture, which I don't have written down for you, and I cannot quote it for you. I'll look for it and try to add it to these notes. Let me just have a note. Get scripture. Second time without sin. When he came the first time, he came as a soul, Christ. Okay. And he gave, it to, he gave himself to the people without dealing with their sins. The second time he's coming, okay, he's coming with judgment. Second time he's coming, it says, the scripture says, without sin. You can't have sin and get these miracles the second time. That's what he's trying to prepare us for. He's coming out of righteousness this time. He's coming with his mother, the Shekinah, the spirit of life, and they're, together they're God. He's coming to prove that God raised him from the dead. Now, there are side effects to that, that we're going to receive life, we're going to be healed, wonderful miracles and wonderful things are going to happen, but the primary motive for Jesus coming again is to prove that God raised him from the dead. And the proof is that he raises us from the dead. Everything else is secondary. God's reputation is on the line. And in particular, to the Jewish people that do not believe that God raised him from the dead. He's coming in particular to spiritual people, to people who know the scripture that don't believe that God raised him from the dead. Receive the witness of men, which that word means Adam. What does that mean? If we receive the witness of Pentecost, if we receive the witness of the soul of the second Adam, which is Christ, okay, that's the seed that came down and joined to our human spirit and became the Holy Spirit. You receive that witness. Well, not the Jews didn't receive it, but the whole church received it. That the witness of the first witness, okay, that the Holy Ghost was in the earth with the soul, which is Christ, which the blood, which was the miracles. If you receive that witness, the witness of God, which is coming, is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. What's coming, what first came was healing a healing and getting people up in wheelchairs. What's coming now is the resurrection of the dead. For this is the witness which, which he hath, God has testified of his son. Verse 11 says, And this is the record, this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. When we manifest eternal life, it is the proof that God raised Jesus from the dead. This is God's testimony of his son. Even Christians don't believe God raised him from the dead anymore. It's not about the virgin birth. It's not about the miracles. It's not about Adam in the garden. It's about God's reputation. He said he raised Jesus from the dead. And the proof are the ones that Jesus will raise from the dead. The proof that God has called me is you all. Verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. So in order to say that you believe on the Son of God, you have to have the witness in yourself. What? 
that you, you're, you're rising from the dead. Well, I, I overcame uh, premature death, you know, but I don't know what the proof is that I'm rising from the dead. So it's not here yet. See? So that means that I don't, technically, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, technically. Listen, if you can understand what I'm saying, that to say that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we're talking about a whole body of knowledge. You can't just say, I believe, I believe he's the Son of God. You have to believe everything that the Son of God did. You have to believe everything that the Son of God is and apply it to the man Jesus of Nazareth or to the glorified Jesus. You cannot say you believe Jesus is the Son of God unless you have a knowledge of who the Son of God is, what he has done, and what you can expect from someone that is the Son of God. Then you take all that knowledge and you look at Jesus, the glorified Jesus, and you say, does it line up? So how can you believe that he's the Son of God if you don't know who the Son of God is or what to expect from him? I thought all I had to do was say I believe Jesus is the Son of God. How naive we all are, brethren. And these pastors that tell you the gospel is simple, don't make it complicated. How naive, brethren. So he believeth that oh, the Son of God has the witness in himself. Well, the witness is, 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 at least it's building in us that we have some knowledge of who the Son of God is and what to expect from him. He that believeth not hath made him a liar. Because he believes not the record that God gave his Son, and this is the record that God has given us eternal life, not after you die, when nobody can see it. Jesus himself said, when someone lights a candle, you don't put it under a bushel, you set it up on a hill so everyone can see it. Why would God make eternal life only after death so nobody can see it? It's the fantasy of an immature church. This is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, Christ Jesus, in you. It hasn't happened yet. But those of us that are getting this body of knowledge, those of us that are getting this teaching, at least now we have a better understanding of who the Son of God is. And listen, brother, what to expect from him. If you say you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you need to know what to expect from him. Do you want a place to live? Do you want your body healed? Do you want more money on your job? Well, maybe he could do that for you, but that doesn't mean that you believe in the Son of God. If you believe in the Son of that Jesus is the Son of God, you have to expect eternal life from him. And if you don't expect that he can give you eternal life, then why are you hoping for a better job or a better place to live? That's the one who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God. That's the, the, the child in your earth. The man-child in your earth, the mind of God, the mind of Christ. He's the one that will get you a better job, get your husband, you know, get you out of poverty. You want to believe Jesus is the Son of God? You need to be expecting eternal life in accordance with the spirit of truth, as the spirit of truth teaches it. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I don't have eternal life at this point. I'm hoping. And we have a couple of octogenarians in this ministry that are hoping, really hoping. We have two, June and Sue Willis. These things have I written unto you that say that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
you know, I, I pondered over that. I thought it was an incorrect translation. These things I have written to you that say that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So what he's saying is you think that you believe on the name of the Son of God, but you don't. I'm telling you this, John the Apostle said, so that you can believe on the Son of God, you need to know that you must believe in eternal life and that he has the power to raise you from the dead. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, it doesn't say he does it. It says he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we are desired of him. So what it doesn't say there, but it says in other places in the scripture, well, it does say that according to his will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If it's according to his will, he will give it to us. But not always in the timing that we would like it to come in. Can any man see his brother? And now, so that's like the end of that section. Now we're starting with verse 16. He says, if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So he's saying we are, well, this is talking about our brother. These are the ones that keep the commandments of God. This message needs to be spread. You, you have to start dealing with your sin nature. That you cannot receive eternal life. The first Adam is not receiving eternal life. And that there is a sin that will result in your death. Brethren, this death, I, I didn't look it up. I didn't look this word up. If it's Thanatos or... I didn't look this word up. Maybe we should take a break. I wanted to look this up and there was something else I wanted to look up for you. What are the scriptures that I want to look up for you? I want to look up the scripture that says who your neighbor is. And this is very important that we know whether this word is thanatos or, or the word for, 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 or necros, the word for complete. Necros means you die root, root and branch. Necros means there's no resurrection ever. Thanatos means your soul could go on. So let's take a break. I really want to look up these couple of scriptures for me and bring them out. This, this um, exhortation, I, 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 brethren, a lot of this, I didn't even know it was coming. The, the revelation that came out, I had no idea it was going to be this powerful. I'm so grateful for this information. And uh, it's like my body is almost tingling from it, that it is so powerful. Eternal life, eternal life is much more than something that we are desiring, and especially you octogenarians. It's, it's much more than it is for you. It's for him. You need to understand how important it is for him. It has to happen. God cannot be called a liar. It's gone on 2,000 years already that he's called a liar. The voices, in particular of the Jews, are ringing in the heavenlies, calling God a liar. People that study the scripture, okay, that should know better, calling God a liar over 2,000 years. It's time for his vindication. You need to know that this is beyond you. Come out of your selfishness. Ask God to do it for his name's sake. I can't promise you anything, but the more you come out of your selfishness, and see it as something for him, the, more, the better chance you have of entering in. The door has to open, you know. I don't, I don't know what the criteria is for the door opening, who knows, I don't know. But I'm telling you this in general. When you ask for something that's for his sake, more than for your sake, it carries a lot more weight. So that's my advice to all of you. And you don't have to be just an octogenarian, you know, people die unfortunately, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, you know, and 70s. Sometimes people die. 
So it's not a bad idea to, for all of us to know everything that he's teaching us, everything that he's doing, it's for him. It's all for himself, training us up to prove to the world who he is. That is our role. Our role is secondary. It will kill your pride. You need to know this. Your role is secondary. It's not all about you. It's all about him. This is what it means to glorify him. If you exalt him, you will be exalted. Get your mind out of yourself. Get your mind out of yourself. It's all about him. Okay? Okay, let's take a break. I want to look up these words for you. Yes? Rose provided a scripture. Oh, she did? Um... It was about earlier what you were talking about. She said, Hebrews 9.28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And then she said, 1 John 5.16 is Thanatos, and then death in, quote, in um, parentheses. It is it's Thanatos. Okay. Wait, tell her to look up neighbor so then I don't have to do it. Rose, what is that scripture that says... Something about your neighbor. It says who your neighbor is. Okay, so what was that scripture that sin um, the second time? Um, Hebrews 9.28. Hebrews 9.28. Thank you, Rose. Coming without sin the second time. And that means there's another scripture that says he's coming with full of soap. He's coming to with the clan. Brethren, it's gonna, it's gonna, when the Lord falls upon the world, this second appearing is going to be traumatic for a lot of people. When Pentecost hit, it was traumatic. Even the people that didn't believe it, it affected the whole Christian world one way or another. This, this revival that's coming, he's coming with judgment for sin. It is going to be traumatic for the whole world. He's coming with, with fuller soap to cleanse us. See? And some will be rejected, hopefully. No one I know, hopefully. It's not his will. You know? But we do have free will. Some will be rejected. It's going to hit the world like a bomb. Everything that's going on right now will pale in the light of his appearance. So, so then I don't, we don't have to take a break then. Okay, so then it's then it turns, okay. So verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, a sin that is not hindering the anointing or calling the anointing unclean, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. How do you give somebody life? I'm not sure whether that means he'll give them the, the Christ seed. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. Rose, what is that word in verse 16? Is it Zoe? Is it Zoe life? There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. is this the sin unto death is coming against the anointing and then I gave you this exhibit about King Josiah I already talked to you about him all unrighteousness is sin but there is a sin that is not unto death all unrighteousness is sin every wrong thought no matter, no matter how innocent you think you might be you need to understand that it's sin yeah First, okay, she couldn't find the scripture about neighbors. Yeah. She said there's a parable in Luke, but she couldn't find the scripture. She's spelling it right. It's spelled with a U. And it, Rose, it's spelled with a U, N-E-I-G-H-B-O-U-R. So if you can find that. Yeah. And then to your second question, she said yes. So. It's Zoe Lent. Okay. okay, verse 17. Thank you, Rose. Wool and righteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God, that is the, ma the mind of Christ, which is the man-child, whosoever has the man-child, whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. Okay, it's not whosoever 
I'm sorry, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. That, brethren, that is the man child. That's interesting. And whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The reason I'm stopping says that we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And I just told you that that which is born of God is the mind of Christ, which can make mistakes. I don't know if God calls that. I don't know if God calls that sin. I know that someone who was teaching by the mind of Christ, if you actually sin, it's, it's your carnal mind doing it. But Christ can make a wrong judgment or a mistake. I, I would think that would be sin, so I don't know what to tell you about this, about this scripture. I have to pray about this. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Okay, so the sin that's, okay, so this is, this is talking about the sin that's unto death. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. But we know that whosoever, that's the man child, is born of God, does not sin the sin unto death, but he that is begotten of God guardeth himself. That goes right back to Genesis. Adam was told to guard himself, and it's translated keep, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So the kind of sin that's being, uh, that's being discussed here, I don't know. That would be different than there's a there's a difference a difference between um, well first of all the sin that's being talked about here where it says and the wicked one touches him not that's talking about spiritual fornication that is talking about a spiritual adultery that is talking about the sin that agrees with the carnal mind and produces a demon that's what James talks about I've mentioned that to you several times that your your um, your unconscious mind, Satan, and your unconscious mind sends forth an evil motive, and your soul agrees with that evil motive, okay, and does the sin, and when, the, when your soul does the sin, a demon is born. Yeah. And then, then that demon now drives you to repeat the, the crime, and it goes on over and over and over again. So that's what this verse is saying here. He keepeth himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. So the mind of God will not agree with Satan. Okay? It's possible to, uh, in, in the process of being trained and learning, to, make a, to, make, to, to not understand something properly. You know, sometimes I don't understand these scriptures properly. It's not in agreement with my carnal mind. It's a, it's a subtle difference. Can you hear it? It's not in agreement with an evil suggestion given out by Satan. That's what's being told here, okay? Evil suggestions, evil motives. Christ will never agree with an evil motive. If anything, no matter how, if 99% of the time you are moving in the mind of Christ, the day that you agree with an evil motive or an evil suggestion that comes out of your core mind, it's not Christ doing it. It's the first Adam in you doing it, okay? But the mind of Christ is capable of not understanding that he hasn't learned yet. Can you, can you hear the difference in this? Mm -hmm. No one? Mm -hmm. You can't hear the difference, Brooke? Mm -hmm. You can't hear the difference? No. Can you hear the difference? Mm -hmm. You can't hear the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay. This, the, the sin that's being spoken about here, and maybe this is the sin that's unto death. Maybe it's more than coming against the anointing. Okay, the mind of Christ guards himself and the wicked one. That word touch, it's a euphemism for spiritual sexual intercourse. Okay. Sin, sin is born in you. Sin is the fruit of the adultery. 
between the Satan in your unconscious mind and your soul, who is supposed to be married to God. Your soul is supposed to be married to the Christ seed, married to the Christ seed. When your soul agrees with an evil motive of Satan, a demon is born, okay? which drives you to repeat that sin again. It is that spiritual intercourse that the mind of Christ does not engage in. Can you hear that? But there is a sin, okay, well, it's that sin that it doesn't do. But there is a sin that's not unto death. It can be a wrong decision in the training process, a, a well-intentioned wrong decision based on the knowledge that they already has, which has nothing to do with agreeing with an evil motive. No one understands me? Mm -hmm. you understand that now? Mm -hmm. You don't understand me? Do you understand what an evil motive is? So the sin that's being discussed here is your soul, your personality, agreeing with an evil motive. Christ will never agree with an evil motive. Okay. Okay. But Christ is a spiritual child. He is both uh, the spirit of God. I'm sorry, he is both the seed of Christ joined to our soul. Okay. He's a new creature that is capable of being trained and learning mm -hmm. and making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between intending, having a right motive, but making a wrong judgment or making a mistake because you, your, your training isn't complete in that area. That's not the same thing as agreeing with a, a motive that wants you to do harm. Can you understand it? Yeah. You understand it? So the Lord gave me the answer right now. Yes. Rose found um, the scripture if you want to hear it. The neighbor? Yeah. yeah. And I think Margaret did too. Um, Margaret said first, is this the verse of our neighbor, Luke 10, 36, which now of these three think, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And then Rose said, I think it's Luke 10, 28 through 37, a parable that starts at 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live, 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And talks about the one having compassion. Did not want to post all the verses. I'm still not sure if that's the right scripture. So that's it. Who was my neighbor? And what did she say about it? The one who has compassion. Is that what it said? And, and then talks about one having compassion. That's the rest of the verses that she Who is my neighbor? Like. Okay. So then it's the one who has compassion. The one who... Oh, that, that's probably the one who picked up... The guy on the Jericho Road and put him on his own ass. And he picked up the guy that was really down and paid, you know, put him in the hotel and paid for him himself. So he said that's who the neighbor was, the one that has the compassion of Jesus Christ. So, so our neighbor is the one that has the compassion of Jesus Christ. And our, and our brethren, our spiritual family, are the ones that keep the commandments of God, that they're doing the best they can to treat their, uh, their, the, their brothers and sisters as they would treat themselves, okay? And the person, so that's the one that has Christ, okay? That's the, that's the, 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 the believers that have received Christ, the soul of God. They're, they're keeping the commandments of God. They're, that's something, brethren, that's something we're capable of doing. We're capable of treating other people as we would like ourselves to be treated. That's not talking about hidden motives of the heart. That's talking about our behavior, okay? So that's what the church, as we know the church today, can do. They can do that if they want to. You control your behavior. You can be nice to people. You can shut your mouth if you're jealous of somebody and you know that you're jealous. You can stop yourself from giving them the knife and say something nice to them and go before God and ask him to forgive you. You can do that. Those are the people of your spiritual family the females, the spiritual males, the one that have the emotions of God, the compassion of God, okay, they're the ones that help the down and out, brethren, listen to me, the people that you would never choose to be your friends in this life, the people that are poor, people that don't dress well, people that can't get you anywhere, they have no influence in this world, okay, the people that it's very easy to abuse, if you have that, and everybody has that to one degree or another, 
to take advantage of the weak, okay? That's the person with the male side of the Lord Jesus Christ operating in them. Got that? Okay. So that's the difference between neighbor and brethren. Very interesting. This is turning out to be a very interesting study. Thank you, Margaret and, and um, Rose. Thank you very much for helping me. And I have to take a break. Okay, so um, let's just finish this out. So, verse 18, we know that whosoever, meaning the mind of Christ, is born of God, does not sin, but he that is begotten of God guards himself, like Adam was warned to guard himself in the garden, and that wicked one will not be able to have spiritual sexual intercourse with him. But he is capable of, of, of not knowing something or making a mistake as he goes through his training, as long as his motive was not evil. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. For then the whole world, it's not, the apostle's not talking about the world out there. The world out there is wicked, and the world out there is getting more and more evil. But when the apostle talks about the whole world, he's talking about our soul world. The whole soul world lieth in wickedness. What does that mean? The very foundation of our existence is the first Adam, which is the fallen female side of the first Adam who married the snake. So our whole world, our whole spiritual world, is first of all, we're lying down. Excuse me. We're lying down. That's why we have all the problems that we have, and that's why we die. Because when we stand erect, okay, when we stand erect, we have a communion, communion with the Lord Jesus Christ who connects us to God, and we stop dying. So the whole world is lying, number one, we're all lying down. And we're lying down under the authority of the wickedness of that union that came into existence between the female side of the first Adam and the snake. So I never understood this scripture that way before. I always thought the whole world is just lying in wickedness. I never realized the apostle was saying the whole world is lying down, okay, under the authority of the wickedness of the first Adam. So we know that we are of God. That means we don't have to yield to that. We need to resist that with all of our strength. And uh, I heard some unknown person on YouTube the other day, and it was a very good exhortation to the, to the body of Christ. You know. He cited all of the evil forces trying to start race wars right now. And there are a lot of people getting involved in this some of it's crazy. A lot of black people getting involved in it. Mm. But a lot of the white people are absolutely crazy. He was saying that he saw a man get out of a BMW with a sign on his car, a resist white power. And he has the guy's driving a BMW. So there are a lot of white people that are just, they're just being, uh, they're just being drawn in like the tide is coming and just drawing all these people into the race wars that are trying to be started in this country. Brethren, we should avoid anything to do, whether you're white, black, green, orange, or yellow, okay? You should do everything in your power to avoid getting involved into anything of a racial nature. Our brethren are the people that obey the commandments of God, okay? And have the compassion of Jesus Christ. Don't get caught up in it, because you're just being used. You're being used by evil powers that are trying to overthrow the government in this country, and if they overthrow the government in this country, it affects the whole world. This is God's, God's, God's base right now. So we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. In wickedness. Don't be a part of it. Don't get caught up in that. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us an understanding, and the understanding is his mother. He's come to give us understanding. Now, I think what the Apostle was saying is that if you, could, if you could understand this epistle, this is a really complicated epistle, if you can understand what he's saying, you've received the understanding of the Mother. So as we know that the Son of God, we, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, that's the Shekinah, that we may know him that is true, that we may know the truth about Jesus Christ. You cannot know the truth about him without the understanding that we're receiving. Okay, you need the spirit of truth. You need the male side 
of the second Adam to understand this and, and the mother that he's attached to, that he brings to us. So we are not the Son of God yet, because the attachment is not permanent, but we are being fed by the Son of God and his mother. We are receiving deep understanding in this ministry. But we cannot call ourselves the Son of God because the attachment is not permanent yet. And the attachment, the permanency of the attachment is witnessed by miracle working power. Okay. So we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Okay, now we're not talking about the one that's, that was born of God. Okay, but he has come as the Christ seed, okay, which becomes the mind of Christ. But we who are understanding this know that the Son of God has come, that's the glorified Jesus Christ, and he has come with his mother, the Shekinah, bringing understanding, and the purpose of their coming to us is that we may know the truth about Jesus Christ, which is the creation of God. He's the beginning of the creation of God, that we should know the truth about him, him that is true, and we are in him that is true. So for understanding this, we're in him, <laughs> Even in his son, Jesus Christ. If all that you have is the female side, you wouldn't be able to understand this. If you could understand this, you know that the Son of God has come to you with understanding and that we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This Shekinah, and I added in the Shekinah, this Shekinah is the true God and eternal life. Now, this is a big problem for the church that thinks that Jesus Christ is God. We have to look at this sentence, brethren. This is the true God and eternal life. Who? This understanding. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Together, the Son of God and His mother are Elohim, God. Jesus Christ alone is not God. The Shekinah, the Shekinah alone, may, I'm not sure about her. She's, she's probably gone alone, but I'm not sure. That we may know him that is true. We either may know the truth about Jesus Christ or the one that is the true image of God. Even his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. The son and the mother together are Elohim. This is the true God and eternal life. When the Lord Jesus Christ, who is attached to his mother, the Shekinah, mm -hmm. joins to the mind of Christ in us, we will know and experience the true God and be eligible for it. And the eternal life will be in us. The eternal life will be in us. And it's a process to, to, uh, to, to actually save our soul and whatever's going to happen to our body. Once, once eternal life is in us, then it will deal with the rest of us. Little children, those of you that have the mind of Christ, little children. If you're not a child, this message isn't for you. If all you have is the Holy Ghost, the apostle is not talking to you. He's talking to the believers that have birthed the mind of Christ. And that that mind of Christ is not under the dominion of the whole world that lies in wickedness, but is, is but, but knows, the people that have these little children, know that they, are, that they are of God, okay, and are not subject to the whole world that's lying in wickedness. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Every lie that you believe about Jesus Christ and about the Son of God and who He is, is an idol in your heart and in your mind. <laughs> little children, those of you that have the mind of God, those of you that have the mind of Christ, you need to understand that the mind of Christ in you is, is lying dead, is still lying down under all of the wickedness of the first Adam. Yeah. Don't believe the lie about Jesus Christ. I've just told you the truth. I've just told you what the record is. I've told you what the witness is. I, I have done my job. I have educated you. Don't believe any lie about the Son of God or Jesus Christ or about yourself. Powerful exhortation, mm -hmm. but very powerful exhortation.